Thanks so much, Haney. It really is my privilege to spend this afternoon with you for a few talks and some workshops with respect to here at Recess X. And it is just so wonderful to be among so many resuscitationists. Know that I truly feel privileged to have made the short drive up from Baltimore this morning where I gave some talks and then coming up here with you all. Now, with respect to the obese patient, just for the sake of time, many of you who have listened to this before know that I talk about a case where I didn't do so well. Many years ago, we had a critically ill, morbidly obese patient come into our emergency department one Saturday morning where I happened to be working with Dr. Matu, many of you know my colleague as well, whereby this patient presented in respiratory distress, was not doing well, and ultimately needed intubation for acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, and well, my pitfalls, my errors that day really led to a poor outcome. And really ever since that case, I've talked about intubating the obese patient. And so I'm gonna go through a few of the things that we really should pay attention to when we have that sick obese patient coming in. Now before you, you can see this changing demographics of the United States with respect to the increasing prevalence of the obese population. Here you can see over time, it continues to grow. And this, from a statistics standpoint, is looking at BMI, which has its own limitations, but we can see how prevalent these patients are coming into our emergency department and in our ICU. Now, this is the latest data published just a few months ago with respect to the percentages of obese patients across the United States, and we've gone from maybe 10 to 15 percent, now upwards of 40 to 45 percent in some states. And these patients have altered physiology that affects our ability to resuscitate them. And there's critical things we should know about when they roll into the emergency department critically ill. With this rising incidence and increasing prevalence of obesity, many have termed this an obesity crisis. In fact, each year, even just from a few years ago, each year we spend almost $300 billion in healthcare taking care of these patients. So let's get to a few critical pearls in the few remaining moments we have right here after lunch regarding RSI and then subsequently with mechanical ventilation. This would come as no surprise to all of you. These patients have both anatomic and physiologic alterations that affect our ability when we go to perform rapid sequence intubation or intubate them. You, not unexpectedly, from an anatomic standpoint, they have excess cervical fat, they have a larger tongue, such that when we lay them back to intubate, it makes for a constricted glottic opening. It's going to make laryngoscopy a little bit tougher. Well, from a physiologic standpoint, we'll touch on in just a few minutes the fact that essentially, due to obesity, all of their lung volumes are down. This decreases lung compliance. They have excess adipose tissue on the chest wall, which decreases chest wall compliance. And as a result, really pearl number one that we must take away when we are resuscitating these patients is they have the rapid onset of hypoxemia. Now, if I just collapsed here in front of you, well, maybe on the couch, and was apneic, how long would I have from a safe apnea time Let's just say you didn't pre-oxygenate me. How many minutes would you have to intubate me should you need to race up and use some of this equipment to intubate me? Six, six to eight minutes. If we increase or I had the opportunity to get FiO2, maybe a little bit longer. When we've got a sick patient, we know that that decreases. And just in patients that we're intubating, let's just say an obese patient for airway protection, that safe apnea time decreases. And when they're critically ill, you've got about 60 to 90 seconds to secure that airway. So how do we go about maybe lengthening the safe apnea time? And in terms of pre-oxygenation, a few pearls, and there's some differing opinions on exactly how to appropriately pre-oxygenate obese patients. But when you look at the literature, really there's some recommendations if you have the capability to actually sit them almost upright to pre-oxygenate them. It helps improve airflow and decrease some of those airflow limitations. Now, with respect to the device, you have to go with what you have. And so many of you listening online may practice in resource-limited settings where you have simply that non-rebreather that you're going to crank up, 
use a nasal cannula that you're going to turn to flush rate for apneic oxygenation. And if you don't have that or you need to, using a BVM with a PEEP valve set at least around 12 to 15 and assisting them with pre-oxygenation. The whole attempt is to increase that safe apnea time so when you go to perform laryngoscopy, you're able to safely intubate that patient. More often than not, when I'm faced with these patients, and you've heard this in other realms and social media podcasts, online lectures, to utilize non-invasive ventilation in this patient population. It really helps us with pre-oxygenation, helps to denitrogenate the lungs and give us that good oxygen reservoir, increasing that safe apnea time. And when using non-invasive ventilation, the literature is mixed regarding CPAP and BiPAP, but in general, you'll see that it's general recommendations for CPAP, but you wanna have at least 10 centimeters of water and you wanna give it at least a few minutes. Recent literature would say mm, probably at least 10 minutes. From a pre-oxygenation standpoint, you know well that is about at least eight vital capacity breaths or at least three minutes. The obese literature would say try to get that a little bit longer to really truly de denitrogenate their lungs. In general, when using non-invasive ventilation, that is gonna give you another one to two minutes of safe apnea time to perform laryngoscopy. Critical pearl number two, so rapid onset of hypoxemia or rapid decompensation. Try to sit them up to pre-oxygenate. Use non-invasive for pre-oxygenation. If you remember just one pearl from this 13-minute discussion, it's patient positioning. And so you're likely to have heard the optimal patient positioning for intubating the obese patient really is to ensure that their external auditory meatus is in line with their sternal notch. Whether that's using towels as in this picture or elevating the head of the bed, we wanna have proper positioning to align those airway axes and quickly and safely intubate the obese patient. So adequate pre-oxygenation, non-invasive ventilation, position them appropriately with that external auditory meatus in line with the sternal notch. What about RSI medications? Lots of controversy around RSI medications. Some of you know Raul Bott down in DC. A few years ago, he published their systematic or their review at their individual site looking at dosing of RSI medications in their obese patient population, about 450 patients, a third of which were obese. And the take home message was these patients from a sedative standpoint were markedly underdosed along with underdosing of the paralytic, which ultimately led to poor intubating conditions. So dosing RSI medications is critical in the obese patient. Once again, there's no consistent guidelines and you'll probably get different opinions based upon who you talk to, but what is in print about the common sedatives we use? Etomidate, typically, dosed on total body weight. Ketamine, ideal body weight. For those of you in resource limited settings that may still need to use benzodiazepines, that is gonna to be total body weight. And if you're using propofol as a sedative in RSI, that is gonna be ideal body weight, the most commonly used sedatives for rapid sequence intubation. What about the paralytic? You likely know these well. From a succinylcholine standpoint, that is total body weight, and rocuronium, something we use almost exclusively at Maryland, that is gonna be ideal body weight. But the key thing here is you're not gonna overdose them on the paralytic. So you really wanna provide adequate medications, especially the paralytic, so that you give yourself optimal intubating conditions on this critically ill patient population. Now with respect to intubating, we all have different skill sets, what we've learned. Many will feel that an awake intubation is probably best for the, in, for the obese patient. Admittedly and in full disclosure, I don't do a lot of awake intubations, much more on the RSI realm, but specifically for intubating this particular patient, video laryngoscopy, I tend to use standard geometry, a MAC4 blade. Because of that excess, excess and redundant tissue in the airway is critical, but this is a scenario where you're calling folks in. So you've got your fellow colleagues in the room, 
to assist you should you need it. Now, the Bougie trial didn't show a consistent benefit for always using Bougie first, but I will be honest, in this patient population when performing video laryngoscopy, I will go ahead and do Bougie first. Obesity, that large tongue, clearly are characteristics that identify someone who may have a difficult airway. Now, once you intubate them, what about mechanical ventilation? So now you've successfully intubated them. A few slides ago, we talked about essentially in obesity, all lung volumes are down. The greatest reduction is in FRC along with expiratory residual volume or reserve volume. But the bottom line is all lung volumes are down to where these patients at baseline have intrapulmonary shunting. In addition, because of that decreased lung compliance, the increased chest wall compliance, they're working hard to breathe just normal tidal volume respirations. So they've got shunting, increased work of breathing, and when they're sitting upright, the upper lung zones are preferentially aerated, the lower lung zones are preferentially perfused. So they've got shunting, their excess work of breathing, they've got VQ mismatch just at baseline before they're challenged with a critical illness. No surprise that their respiratory muscles are working in overload most of the time. They have an increased oxygen consumption and increased CO2 production. Now, unfortunately, there are no guidelines specifically with ventilating the obese patient, but here are a few quick pearls that you know well. Remember, and we've committed this error at least three times at Maryland, setting the tidal volume is ideal body weight, not total body weight. We've certainly harmed a few folks at Maryland because of inaccurate tidal volume setting. Now, with respect to respiratory rate, because they have increased work of breathing, increased CO2 production, you want to actually set the ventilator a little bit higher in terms of respiratory rate. Now, that will be dependent on what you've intubated and ventilating them for, the overall condition. But no, in general, you may want to do a little bit higher respiratory rate and definitely higher PEEP than what you're reflexively used to setting in your intubated ED patients. So not the reflexive five, six, seven. These are much higher levels of PEEP. And finally, from a patient positioning standpoint, as best you can, have that adipose tissue headed towards their feet. So if possible, I know this is an OR table, but a reverse Trendelenburg position that has been shown to allow you to ventilate the patient better lower lung volumes, lower plateau pressures, easy, easier ability for mechanical ventilation. So with that, Haney, just a few critical pearls in intubating the obese patient. Remember, pearl number one, they have no pulmonary reserve. Rapid desaturation, rapid onset of hypoxemia. We want to do what we can in terms of pre-oxygenation to augment our safe apnea time, if possible, sit them up to pre-oxygenate them, preferentially use non-invasive ventilation with at least 10 centimeters of water in terms of that pre-oxygenation, dosing our RSI meds appropriately, setting the right tidal volume, higher PEEP levels, a little higher respiratory rate, and patient positioning is key once you've intubated them and started them on mechanical ventilation, preferably head of the bed up or in a reverse Trendelenburg position. With that, Haney, a few pearls and rapid succession on intubating the obese patient. <laughs>